Next up is Dr. Jason Swedlow of the University of Dundee. Jason is professor of quantitative cell biology and co-founder of the Open Microscopy Environment, OME, that provides open source software for bioimage data management for microscopy. OME is a database structure and analysis platform that supports many academic laboratories and commercial sources of image analysis software. Jason will talk about making bioimage data fair. Fair data are data which meet principles of findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. You can ask Jason questions by using WebEx chat or emailing us at nih-doe-bioimaging at nih.gov. Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening from Scotland, where it's a beautiful firm. Um, thank you so much for, uh, to the NIH and the Department of Energy for the invitation. Um, I've actually had a great time listening to the previous speaker. So I'm going to a great talk. I'm going to talk about um, um, probably a slightly more practical side of um, all of this, um, of, of this imaging world, and that is making the data that we're all generating as um, fair, as Paul said, um, available for the um, reuse uh, by the community. Um, and I have to say this is a project uh, from OME. Um, we're part of several national and transnational um, efforts and often also a commercial effort called uh, Going to Spot Um So I did uh, the American style disclosure. Um, everything you're going to see in this talk is um, open source and is available. Um, I'll put a link to the slides in the chat in a second. Everything is available and publicly. Anyway, um, so um, we founded um, we founded a commercial company called Google Software back in 2004 to provide commercial access to most of the technology um, I'm going to show you today. Um, basically, you can think of this as another way of getting technology out into the community. So um, normally, I spend a little few minutes um, on the slide talking about images everywhere. I've seen that um, beautiful um, description from the previous speakers. So, here are my examples that you've already seen. Um, uh, it's great being an imaging person. Um, you get to show pretty pictures in these slides, but obviously, as, as um, uh, Jamie and Anne and, uh, well, have illustrated, um, the reason we're doing um, uh, imaging experiments is because we're taking um, spatially resolved measurements, temporally resolved measurements. Of cell tissue constitution, architecture, and dynamics. Uh, we have amazing resolution. We can see down to individual molecules. We can, um, and we can link uh, those uh, signals we get from those individuals to various uh, important things of scientific states, biological states, um, disease states, and so on. So um, all of that is happening everywhere all, all, at, at many different scales. Um, and so the question starts to become, how do you handle the data sets that we're all generating? How does, of course, the lab of the what they're doing? Um, um, and if, for example, uh, Anne and my lab wanted to collaborate on some data sets, how would we do that? How would we start treating the data sets as resources that we could share? And how do we publish them in the papers to be included in the regulatory filing of the drug company and so on? So that's really the problem we're starting to work on. And so the project I've been leading here at Dundee since the past 2002 is called OID. Um, and um, it doesn't do any of the cool great things that we've heard from the other um, papers. Um, so we're not about coming up with great new analytic tools or new imaging modalities, as you've heard, maybe heard in some of the other webinars. But we're about building the software infrastructure that integrates between these different um, uh, between these different functions that you see on the slide. So you can think of us as the stuff in the middle, but uh, sometimes people would call us APIs or um, interfaces or a way for interoperability. But whatever you call us, um, what we're trying to do is um, uh, provide ways to routinely and at, at seriously large scale connect basically new, many new data types with um, all of the analytic tools, um, the great processing um, tools that you've seen in the talk before. So briefly, the technology, again, all of this is for software. Many words on the slide. These are all um, uh, tools that uh, we, um, re we release, uh, the data specification, file format, file format readers, a database application called Mero, and a 
full data publication system called IBR, and I'll briefly go through a few of these. Again, these words in Google will, um, will get you all of the resources. So Bioformat is a proprietary file format conversion tool. So it reads the binary data and the, and the, meta, and the associated metadata from about 150 different uh, proprietary file formats that, um, that are out there in the wild that are produced by various imaging systems. It converts those different, um, uh, all of those different uh, data types into a common model and hands them off in real time to whatever software it's using by format. So you can think of it as a plugin for translating proprietary file formats. Um, it's used in open source software, as it's a CG, as a software profiler, as um, Anne mentioned earlier. Uh, it's, it's embedded in lots of commercial software as well. Um, it's built upon the submissions from the community, and you see some of the numbers in the center of the slide. These are data sets that people have sent to us and asked us to be first engineer. And so we've been able to do that and then release a, a reader for the file format. I mentioned at least 150 different files on formats. Um, that's definitely true, but it reads many different variants of each of the file formats. For example, 17 different variants of the medical imaging DICOM standard that has been produced by various commercial imaging centers. But um, I should say that bioformats is used all over the world. Um, we register about 100,000 starts a day um, around the world and about uh, 40,000 IP addresses. Um, there seems to be a number of different research institutions. The other application that we build is, is Amero. Amero is a full-blown enterprise data management system. So it's a server client um, system. So on the back end, uh, we have a variety of different data stores for storing the different data types we need in um, imaging. A middleware application that basically amalgamates all that data connects to a standard and secure internet connection to lots of different clients. And so C, C++, Python, MATLAB, Web, um, Java, et cetera. All, your, these applica- all of these different types of applications can be a client of America. Now, these are software systems um, that we distributed for many years, and um, the, the, the large number of people used for the managing the data. But we also, as I'll tell you about in a second, um, realized that we could also use this as a data participation system. So what we've been doing for the last many years is, is distributing the software. And either we or others have been taking software and, and setting up an architecture, something like on the slide. So in a laboratory or um, an institution, you have many different imaging uh, modalities, uh, all writing out to large file source. File formats is that, is that interface that gives you a single access um, mechanism to all of those different data types and different localities and different file formats. Importantly, those file formats, um, uh, we preserve the native file format so we're not converting the data. File format is, is doing the translation on the fly. And then other things can take that um, data. We put a marrow on top of that, and then you have an interface that, for example, the remote client, for example, the web browser, or your cluster, um, and then also some stuff. And so one um, key point, um, I'm going to show you a bunch of screenshots. You're going to have to imagine that you're looking at a screenshot up here by the remote client, for example, a web browser, and this whole system is sitting up in the, um, um, each of us. So I'm not going to say anything about that now, but the previous um, Speakers um, did a great job of that. Amero both um, and connects to lots of different open source or commercial tools, including ANS, um, the work of ANS, work of major programs like Profiler, but so many others. Um, and these are um, uh, these are examples of where we've uh, we either have open source software or open documentation. But what I'll focus on for the rest of the talk is this idea of publishing data, making data um, um, uh, public and available. Um, so one example is um, from the GBI here in the United Kingdom. Um, this is at the Empire um, uh, database. This is a, an archive of cellular electron microscopy. And remember this client server architecture. So here's a client visualization tool that's sitting on, on the top of an Amero server, um, giving multi-dimensional visualization. In Japan, um, Suichi and Ami's group at Zika has built the system of uh, science and biological dynamics database. Uh, this is really a tool for um, doing a lot of querying of um, uh, dynamic data in C. elegans and other uh, dynamic systems. Back in the U.S., um, this is um, uh, just recently announced that uh, the, the uh, DPOI, the paper that's on my archive, 
This is from Diana Sanders, uh, Marcella Vesova, and Howard Lab, Advertical. This is their um, atlas of a series of human uh, images of human patriotic, patriotic um, uh, preparations uh, from uh, many different regions. And so, again, America on the back end. Um, Harvard Medical School, the Peter Sorgos group, uh, this is cyclic fluorescence. I hope many of you have seen this technology. It's one of an amazing set of multi technologies that have appeared. Now looking at many tens of biomarkers in the same tissue. This is human breast cancer, uh, human breast cancer. This data is uh, part of the human tumor atlas network on the slide on the page. Um, out in uh, Portland, uh, this is Joe Gate, just great group. Um, this is part of their microenvironment uh, perturbation uh, project where they're looking at drug responses in the context of any different um, uh, 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 episode metric formulations. And um, all of the data is managed and published in there. On top of these, this is uh, Gary Turner's lab at Harvard Medical School. That's an atlas of uh, um, uh, intestinal uh, tissues of the mark with various uh, uh, California. So all of these are open tools, and again, there's a narrow sitting at me, managing all the data, file format, handling all the file, uh, file format, and then some kind of client. So we really think that it's now possible to make these uh, data sets that we all talk about truly fair. Um, so just to pick up on the things that the previous speaker said, first of all, the data that are available, they're, they're open, um, and also they're well labeled. And so they um, are, uh, there's an awful lot of metadata, uh, the markers, the phenotypes, the regions of interest, and so on are all there. So really driving forward this idea of using these uh, data for training sets. Um, many of these data sets are findable through DOI, accessible through open API. Uh, there's a lot of uh, use of common vocabulary that um, accessible and used. So um, it's great that all of that's happening, um, and we saw this trend moving towards public imaging data several years ago. And inspired by that, we decided that if we could see if we could build a effectively a common uh, resource to publish uh, imaging data. Um, uh, for the community, and so we called this project the Image Data Resource, and the idea was to be taking now many different um, uh, data sets for many different modalities uh, with an awful lot of uh, experimental and molecular metadata, all of the analytic results we set hands-on, um, and put this into a single system and do all of the careful curation and creation and test whether it actually would be viable to uh, do all of that work in the first place and what science could come out of it. Obviously, we need, we need some kind of web-based um, browsing system. We'd have to bolt on some sort of cloud-based analytic system because the data blogs we're talking about, uh, we couldn't expect people to just download the data. We also were told over and over again, and this turns out to be true, that people do want to download the data. So we had to find ways to take terabytes of data available. So this is all running. The IDR is up and running. There's the URL. It's ready today. And um, we're grateful that this is running at the European Biodramatic uh, Institute on their open stack cloud um, that they call Embassy. I have to say that um, this isn't just about some crazy people up in Scotland that are doing this. They're doing this in context of a much larger transnational project called Europe Imaging. This is one of the um, uh, European scientific infrastructures that are funded by the European Commission. Um, Neurobioimaging is building um, the research infrastructure uh, for um, in, uh, bio, bioimaging and uh, biomedical imaging in Europe. As you can imagine, there's many different parts of this. It's a massive project. Um, as you can imagine, we're, we're, um, we're making contributions to something in space. So, um, immediately you might start asking, okay, so what imaging data goes into something like this? And um, uh, IDR is very focused on what we call reference imaging. So um, there are images from many different modalities um, across cells and tissues at many different scales. But what when you unite them is annotations that are around the molecular perturbations or treatments or information that um, in the experiments uh, that generated the images. So genes, antibodies, proteins, drugs, compounds, biological information, and so on. So it's those annotations that provide the richness in the data. So you get an awful lot of people coming to us saying, I want to publish my data in IDR. And the question back is, okay, tell us about the metadata that's associated in, uh, with the imaging data. So we're actually quite selective in the data sets that we publish. I'll talk more about in a few minutes about what happens to everything else. But the idea in IDR is you have these very rich, um, well annotated data. And obviously, that's captured. 
And obviously, we're also interested in the analytic output, for example, the regions of interest like AMCHO's um, information program, the site. And so um, we've been taking that forward. Just to give you a little bit of uh, a vital statistics, we've been running IDR and uh, since um, introduction since um, 2017. Using the number of that are in the public uh, resource. Lots of big numbers here. Um, closing in on 170 terabytes of data in the next couple months, we'll get over 200 terabytes. Um, a reasonable number of five dimensional images of space, time, and channel. Think of that in terms of planes, just about, just, uh, just shy of 63 million planes. We have a large number of annotations, most of the genes in the genome, uh, as a human genome, are uh, represented on one or another. We're working at quite a scale here, and, um, I don't have taken out all the slides that go into that, but, um, if we were to run this, not on EBI resources, but on, um, on uh, Amazon Web Services, on AWS, with cost of about $14 a month, doing everything that we're doing. So we're very grateful to EBI for uh, allowing us to use their resources, especially for, 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 um, for free as a conversion. IDR is heavily hit. Um, there are IP addresses around the world. Uh, they sort of map to where there are um, uh, research institutions. Um, and so that's, that's great. Um, uh, probably more important, and you have to slide a slight out of date, but we're up into the 70, about 70 different studies. So they have a relatively small number. But we're publishing imaging uh, data, um, linked to, you know, annotated with DOI, linked to the papers. And in many cases now we're publishing the data sets as they are published along, as the paper that, that describes them, uh, uh, as it is published, um, as well. And so now we're, it's now possible to publish these data sets alongside the original paper. I'm um, but obviously, as you see, many different journals, many different biological models, and lots of different large projects that are publishing something that's you know, uh, excuse me, in IDR. So this is the front page of IDR if you go there today. Um, we now have enough different data sets that we've um, started to divide um, IDR into, into cell IDR and tissue IDR. We think that probably is probably a, a division that would be useful for users. We'll see how, how people react to that. Um, but you can search for cell data, tissue data through different studies. You can search for cross different genes. There's a submission system. The URL is there. Um, and just very quick example. So this is, um, so as you might have guessed, this is bioformats of the marrow that have been tuned in various ways for IDR. This is a, a single molecule fish study um, uh, from uh, Neurofetal, uh, looking at yeast of uh, Um This is uh, from Jimmy LaFarm. This is uh, Philip Keller's lab. This is their definitive um, mapping uh, state map of the mouse embryo, uh, recorded with a sheet microscopy. Um, uh, this is from a map um, by Bush's lab at Cape Western. This is uh, a deep learning study where they're looking at cardiac biopsies and trying to predict quite successfully, in fact, um, uh, the different types of uh, damage to heart muscle from cardiac biopsy. So, uh, you know, so this, this, you know, this is just one example for example, you know, we obviously are not doing the, uh, anything to do with the algorithms here, but we're publishing the original data that they use uh, for their training sets. And I think this is the last example. This is from the Human uh, Protein Atlas. Uh, the Human Protein Atlas is this amazing resource of, um, of, uh, the localization of, of, of protein um, in uh, human cells and tissues. They have a, this beautiful resource that um, reports um, the localization by IAC staining of, um, uh, of um, up to 26,000 different um, antibodies, uh, the antigens uh, to the antibodies that they made. But the, but the original data has never been available. And so now um, we are now working on publishing the, the original data for these um, Localizations. We have 7,000 antibodies published. We're working through, uh, through steps of thousands as they step them down. So why do we want all this data? Why is this useful? I, I think the previous speaker started to uh, illustrate that. But just to show you that the annotations that we have, so as you mentioned, we are, we have the cell line in this case. We have the gene that was targeted in this case by an siRNA. We have that elsewhere. And we also have the phenotypes that were calculated um, uh, by an image analysis um, result. We have those. We have those analytic results. So we have, I think it's the eccentricity in this case. But we also have the, the phenotype, the phenotypic concept that the authors stated associated with that measurement. 
We've then done the work to identify um, uh, a, a controlled vocabulary where we had terms that would express that phenotype and that we've done all of that annotation. And what that means is that we can connect the phenotypic concept to the genes, and we actually can make search tools that, that would allow you to, for example, search, um, uh, search for genes or search for phenotypes. We can make those phenotypic searches based on the text, or we can make them uh, based on ontological IDs. And so all of that's um, available in public, and I hope you have a look at it. Just to move on, um, we can then build analytic tools alongside. So this, what this is, is uh, the Jupyter, uh, uh, some of you are, this is a technology that some of you are familiar with. So this is the Jupyter um, system that takes an iPhone notebook. Um, in this case, searching for genes, some of you will recognize this with the R23 complex, critical complex of controlled action summarization. And here we're asking RDR for the phenotypes that are associated with various gene targeted, gene targeted perturbations in various different screens. So here are the different screens on uh, the right, phenotypic, phenotype, phenotype accession columns, uh, different um, IDs. And it turns out that we can, um, we can recapitulate what's known in terms of genetic interactions already, but we can also discover new ones that we're taking, that we're taking forward. So, um, just to summarize where we are with IDR, we've been publishing these data, this highly curated data. Um, it's a searchable and scalable. We're linking the various kinds of data. We're providing um, analytic tools. And where I want to kind of finish is this last point that can be explored by others. And so just to emphasize, all of this is open source and everything is available and um, have a URL to there. So where are we going with this? Um, there's a huge issue which I took. 12 slides out about file formats. And so we are exposed to the amazing diversity um, of file formats, but also we, we're starting to see data sets where the kinds of file formats that are being written by many commercial systems are just basically incompatible with the use cases that people want to do. For example, very large visualization, machine learning, et cetera. And did a great job of highlighting image SC. Um, I'll point you to um, a discussion that's ongoing there funded by the Chad Zuckerberg Initiative, where we're looking to, with the community, to design the next generation of all forms. Where do we want to go and, you know, in terms of data, arch data you know, making data archiving you know, truly um, routine? So I showed you IDR, and I mentioned that there's a fairly small number of studies in there. That's this highly curated set of reference data. So we need something that's much more akin to an archive that can hold stuff, you know, effectively all of the important imaging studies that are associated with scientific publications. Um, in this uh, white paper that we published with our colleagues at the NBL, uh, late 2018, this idea of an archive was um, just notional, and we'll see the dotted line. However, um, in, um, in 2019, um, the, the um, UK government announced funding for um, the biomedia archive about 42 million pounds to um, EDI. So they are building this. And the idea is that um, imaging data sets will be um, routinely published. They will either be in some kind of archive resource or, for example, some kind of added value resource. And obviously, we want these things to connect it. And as you can imagine, we are working quite carefully with our colleagues at EDI to make, to make a seamless uh, communication uh, between these resources. I should emphasize that, you know, I just told you about a couple of different resources, our work on NER, um, EBI's work on the Biomedia Archive. Nonetheless, this is clearly a global problem, and uh, we're um, in Japan, again, our, our colleague Shu Shinami is building um, actually their version of these resources, this archive and then uh, the value resources, the SSPD um, repository and database. So we're really starting to see a global ecosystem that, um, um, it's, uh, it's becoming established, and um, we're all working together on this. So I think there's a huge, you know, over the next few years, going to see a huge um, key change um, in the kind of the amount of data that's available and the value of the data um, in the community. I just emphasize sitting here in 2020, obviously the world's changed a lot in the last few months, but the world of imaging data has transformed in the last five years. Everything I told you, um, uh, I told you about, you know, five years ago, it didn't exist. Um, so, um, just to finish up, we don't want just one IDR, but we want, um, we're quite interested and um, grateful to see a lot of other people building their own IDRs. Very technical slide, 
basically one command, or these four commands build our whole system in a cloud environment, for example, OpenStack or AWS. And um, there are now several IDRs that are being constructed. Um, there's a marine biology IDR, there's a few digital pathology IDRs. We can talk about the human up to sell atlas um, communities as well. And so we're really seeking, starting to see a, a blossoming of these resources worldwide. And again, um, uh, this is a really rich and exciting time um, um, in this field, but also um, you know, a great uh, community that's working together. And obviously, we all need to connect into archives, and so that is the so just to summarize, I've shown you a series of um, open tools that you can use for accessing and um, managing your data, a data publication system, also IDR. And I think it's true that, you know, fair, you know, a few years ago people, a lot of people say, ah, oh, the data is too big, it's too hard. Making bioenergy data is not only possible, but I think these demonstrate the fact that it's valuable. It's a really cool global community that I urge you to get involved with to look forward to work from so, uh, just to thank everybody's involvement with this um, funding, you say the welcome to the SFC, several EU projects, and the Shannon Zuckerberg initiative. And it's amazing things that I'm very good at So, thanks for the opportunity and look forward to talking more.